Low grade glioma is accounting for 5 to 15 percent of primary brain tumors. Uh, the World Health Organization has a classification uh, uh, system where they look at all tumors and of course they look at brain tumors and, and I'm just going to put that up to reference uh, uh, as a reference for you but uh, uh, we're going to talk really about three different types of tumors the, the common ones that uh, we see and face and that affect people and those are the astrocytomas, the oligodendrogliomas, and then the so-called mixed tumors. We're talking about the grade 2 tumors today. Those are the ones that are generally classified as, as the low-grade gliomas. There's a grade 1 tumor and, and uh, it's usually seen in, in, in kids. We're going to talk mostly about the grade 2 tumors in adults today. Uh, commonly uh, uh, these tumors occur, you know, 30, 35, 40 years of age and the most common presentation is, is with a generalized seizure or sometimes a focal seizure where people don't actually lose consciousness and that happens about 80 percent of the time. We talk about primary tumors and, and secondary tumors. The secondary tumors are the cancers and I'm talking about tumors in the brain now. So cancers are said to be malignant and by malignant I just mean fast growing. The primary tumors are different in that we talk about primary tumors as just those that arise in the brain so they don't come from anywhere else and there's a whole spectrum of them a and some are benign and by that term we just mean slow growing. Malignant generally means fast growing and there's some intermediate in grade uh, and at the rate at which they grow there is an incredibly variable outcome with these tumors and we're still trying to understand why a and so when you're given this diagnosis no one has this percentage likelihood of surviving for this long okay and that's a very difficult concept for me to understand no one's got that crystal ball a and it's really important you know a lot of physicians and, and, and people use these statistics to try and put things in perspective for people, but they're at best ballpark figures, okay? And they're never going to predict what's going to happen to our patients who have these tumors. It's a serious diagnosis. So if you just consider the statistics, well, you know, it's in the same ballpark as some of the cancers that we treat. But we all know patients survivors with breast cancer, cured patients with breast cancer. I have two good friends who are well beyond their, their so-called prognostic significant. Well the astrocytoma comes from this cell. This is the astrocyte, okay? And these are the most common cells in the brain. And here's a, a fancy picture of one, but you can see its relationship to blood vessels and to neurons and to oligodendrocytes and, and it, it really is a supporting cell that's involved in the metabolism, the nutrition and, and the chemistry around the neurons and, and it's how the brain scars. Okay, so brain scar, lay down scar through the astrocytic process. So uh, it's a very common cell and it, you know, from time to time can degenerate into a tumor cell. I've got some MRIs here and, and I'm just going to review them because it's probably one of the most important tools in, in brain tumor surgery today. And, and MRIs are, are all kind of taken in section. And, and CAT scans are taken in section two. We often get three-dimensional images uh, with every MRI we take. But this picture here is, is a horizontal cross-section, okay? And, and just to reference you, the forehead would be up here, okay? Back of the head here. Now the way they take the picture, the patient's lying on their back, so with the back of the head here, the eyes up here, it just makes the right side over on the left side of the picture. And I'm sure they did that to confuse us, but it's critical now that they don't do it the other way because we're also used to dealing with it this way and as you can imagine right and left make a big difference to a surgeon so <laughs> but here is a, a picture of a tumor and that would be right over here okay and, and a patient uh, and, and this is kinda what it looks like the difference between the normal tissue and, and you can see it's angry there's a lot more cells they're plump and there's dividing cells and, and it's an entirely different process now the oligodendroglioma is a little different and it's closely related to the, uh, uh, the processes coming from the neurons and, and they're often referred to as satellite cells and here you can see one here around a neuron and, and they often we, we look at them they look like fried eggs and, and that's how a pathologist often recognize them but the oligodendrocyte is important for laying down this coating to the nerve processes and that's called myelin 
But here's that typical fried egg appearance here. And again, just the multiplicity of cells, so the increased number, which is so characteristic of any cancer. So the cause is, is still a bit of a puzzle for us. And, and uh, the one thing that we know causes tumors is radiation. And uh, uh, radiation damages our DNA, our genes. And, and as I'll, I'll explain on a, on a subsequent slide here, there, there seems to be a balance between genes that you know, favor production of tumors and, and then what are called tumor suppressor genes that tend to inhibit that process. Okay, but that's the one thing we know can damage genes and it can cause virtually any tumor. Um, cell phones has been in the, the news for the last few years and it, it's always a, a big question. We don't have any conclusive evidence on, on cell phones. Complex genetic abnormalities, probably some environmental factors that, that predispose uh, our patients to the development of these tumors. So. One of the things I think we need to recognize about the low-grade glioma is that it can change, okay? Um, the vast majority of the grade fours, or the glioblastoma, arise de novo, okay, 90%. About 10% over five, 10 years or so will degenerate grade twos, astrocytes, or even the oligodendroglioma, although much less commonly, into a more aggressive form. We know that most of these tumors occur in older people, but not all of them. Most of these tumors occur in younger people. And, and, and this is one of the reasons that perhaps we're being more aggressive with treatment nowadays because people are living longer. And as we're living longer, we're seeing more problems like this. And that's the same with almost any cancer as, as we're facing new challenges sometimes because we've been effective at, at treating the primary tumor. And, and perhaps one of the more exciting things is, is how many people are, are, are getting on this bandwagon. And a very beautiful peach, picture of what's referred to as the cortical spinal tract. So this is your movement tract coming down from the brain stem up into your cortex. And, and it's uh, uh, developed and, and the website's there uh, in the Human Connectome Project. And we talk about connectomics now is this science of trying to understand the connections at a level never before even anticipated. And, and these things are, are gonna change how we do things. They're gonna change outcomes because our understanding is gonna be better. And uh, the uh, Human Connectome Project just uh, published their, their first uh, um, uh, quarter I information. It's all open source data and so you can go to their website and you can see it and it's fascinating stuff. The problem is uh, uh, probably a, a few years ago um, there was maybe 30 papers published a year in this. Now there's over 300. So I used to have to read my journals once a month. I got to read them every week now because this is just exploding and all this information is coming out. And, and, and yeah, over time I think it'll have a, a significant impact on, on how I do surgery. So every patient I see, I think of with a low-grade glioma, I think about these options. Should we do nothing? And the do nothing means serial imaging. We need to monitor the situation. Should we do a biopsy, either followed by some observation or you know, use some of the adjunctive methods that we have to try and damage, kill some of the remaining tumor? Or should we try and do a bigger operation maybe followed by observation if it's a low grade tumor or if it's a higher grade tumor the standard of care involves using both of these and as you can see it, it's still a bit of a puzzle today and, and yet we have more and more evidence on, on how best to proceed in any individual. This is the more sensitive type of MRI but the less specific type so it shows us all the abnormality but doesn't actually tell us where it is but this is all we really had. We could see this abnormality. And so in that case, we elected to follow the patient and we did a picture two months later, which was exactly the same. And then four months after that, it was quite an alarming growth. And I've only seen this a couple times, but that's why when we do the observation thing, we have to be very careful. Okay, we have to pick things up before the patient gets sick. And this patient underwent successful surgery this week and uh, is doing very well. Nice thing about it, is less invasive, relatively high diagnostic yield, short hospital stay and complication rate very low. The problem with them is, is, is probably the most important one is, is so-called 
sampling error. And by that I mean you take a piece of a tumor, it's not necessarily representative of the rest of the tumor. And these tumors are variable. And what it means to the patient is the fastest growing component of that tumor defines their prognosis, defines their eligibility for the adjunctive treatments and things like that. So you can take one area and it can be very slow growing. Well there could be a faster growing component in that and that would make a big difference. You know, to summarize, you know, we're witnessing a, a revolution in, in, in imaging and the brain and in our understanding of you know, what it means to the outcome of patients with low-grade gliomas. I like this quote by, by Dr. Einstein. The world was created by the Word of God so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear. Well, those are the, the atoms and, and we're approaching that now with these special techniques. We're only going to be limited, limited by our imagination and, and what we can understand, we can over, overcome. So there's definitely hope. Thank you for your attention.